What's going on guys, Sunny AK, The Random Recorder here, and if I did my job right and you're watching this on the right day, it should be January 1st, so Happy New Year everybody! Guess what? All of the problems from 2020 are still here, because time is a flat circle and a human construct that has no real bearing on the events that occur in reality. So to cheer you guys up, I figured I'd go ahead and give you guys part two of the retrospective of the rebuild, because nothing cheers people up quite like Evangelion. I mean, who doesn't like a little mutilation vor and mind break from time to time, right? Huh. I think I realized why nobody wanted to come to my Evangelion birthday party last year. Well, more for me. Now, after watching Evangelion 1.0, the only thing I was thinking was, man, if Evangelion 1 was so good, how come they never made an Evangelion 2? So, 2009, Evangelion 2.0 You Can Not Advance was released, and boy howdy, I am 10 times more excited to talk about this movie than 1.0, because I have actual thoughts and opinions and things to say about this movie, and I just liked it a whole lot more than the first one. Without a doubt, this movie is a lot bolder than 1.0, changing a lot of things, and was clearly Anno's effort to push the story and the Ava franchise as a whole into a new direction. You remember how the last movie was a fairly straight retelling of the first six episodes of the original TV series? Well, Anno dramatically changed things up with this one, mixing elements from episodes 9 through 12 as well as 18 and 19, and I honestly think this was a pretty good move. The original show begins to get a bit repetitive towards its middle, and while it retains its character building and interaction, the increased character depth comes at the expense of the overall plot and story, which slow down significantly. In the last video of the retrospective series, I mentioned that Anno had begun to show development as a writer, and that continues here, as 2.0 introduces several scenes and changes plotlines to help balance out both sides of the storytelling equation. And while the characters don't entirely have as much richness as they do in the show, I'd say it's about the best balance one could get. One specific instance of Anno problem solving through these changes comes in the form of Rey. By his own admission, Rey had become a bit of a wasted character in the original show. As Anno put it, in short, if she and Shinji completely communicated there, there referring to the end of episode 6, then isn't she over with? At that moment, Rei for me was finished. However, in 2.0 you can see that Anno furthers both Rei and Shinji in order to craft a new story entirely through them, with the entire climax and ending of this film being completely new material that's drastically different from anything featured in the show. And I think it works really well with both Rei and Shinji having really interesting growth throughout the film. The specific plotlines used in the movie really helped to develop Shinji into more of a heroic character. Yeah, that is a bit of fan service and rewriting, but I don't mind it in this case. The way he develops feels natural, and it works surprisingly well, being a somewhat refreshing take on him, leading to a really satisfying ending. Honestly, I'm really glad these changes worked out because last time Anno made a movie to change things from the original series, we got this. So, all things considered, it could have been worse. However, not every change Anno made works, and anyone who's watched this movie probably knows who I'm about to talk about, Mari Makanami Illustrious. Mari Makanami Illustrious is a new character that was introduced in 2.0 and is not featured at all in the original series. However, she just doesn't feel like a well thought out and deliberately written character unlike the rest of the cast. It feels like a puzzle where everyone has a set clear place that was created by the original show, and you can tell that she just doesn't belong. For example, take Asuka. At the time of Neon Genesis Evangelion's conception, new tropes and ideas were being written at the time, as anime and manga were still relatively developing mediums. One example of this is the Sundere, a trope characterized by stubborn hot-headed characters who usually develop a warmer side over time. Another major element of the trope is that these characters almost always have feelings for the main character, but refuse to admit them. Many of the other shows at the time were writing their characters in a more idealistic way, that led to Sundere's being more loved and accepted as an archetype. Anno took a look at this trope, and with Asuka he flipped it on its head. She's neurotic and downright hostile towards Shinji, almost being an exaggeration of that type. On top of that, he takes her defining characteristic of being unwilling to admit her feelings and gives it depth throughout her backstory and her character. Asuka's meant to be a tsundere as they would be in real life, undermining and redefining the emerging trope by writing it with more depth and in a more realistic way. 
Mari, however, just doesn't do that. She isn't written into a character dynamic with anyone, she doesn't feel like she embodies a trope or anything. Honestly, it's abundantly clear she's meant to be kind of a fan service character. She's basically a very bubbly, energetic character who, I'm gonna go ahead and say it, is designed to be hot. Are you winning, son? Now, I don't think this is some sort of horrible new addition that ruins the entire franchise, and I'm not gonna make an hour long video about it, but I do think that Mari as a whole provides an intriguing look at the development of the anime industry as a whole. In 2005, Honor wrote a bit of a foreword slash essay for the manga Mobile Suit Gundam The Origin. In it, he states, Audiences have come to need a work only as an escape from reality, as a comfortable dream, judging everything on the criterion of moe, while creators' intellectual paucity and the jumble of trivial touches have encouraged that structure. Moe, by the way, is a semi-abstract concept that basically refers to things in anime, usually women and girls, that viewers tend to find cute or somewhat desirable and become attached to, and I would call it cringy if I weren't admittedly part of the problem. But I honestly do see exactly where Anno's coming from. Within the last few decades, the anime industry seems to have developed around the concept of moe and female characters that audiences can get attached to. I mean, how many anime can you think of where the female characters aren't immediately judged and viewers don't begin waifu wars with? Hell, Anno's own Neon Genesis Evangelion is one of the first major instances of starting waifu wars. I mean, it's been 25 years and people are still arguing over which mentally unstable 14 year old they want to f Come on, obviously we gotta go with the mentally unstable 29 year old, but you get what I'm saying! Now, Anno has stated that he wanted to do more with Mari, but found that the structure of the original series was so rigid that it essentially could not allow another character to exist in it. But he still added her in, which results in her being a very simple character that clearly fits within the concept of Moe, and that I feel primarily exists to sell and create new merchandise for fans. D sorry, I, I know Toy Story 2 is unrelated, I just feel like that's a good representation of like the average anime fan. However, Mari does do one thing that I can be very thankful for. Being a bit of a wild card character that makes a bunch of action scenes entirely different from how they looked in the original show. The way I see it, this movie feels like a flex all over 1.0 in the same way that this video is a massive flex on our video about 1.0. The animation team truly works some magic here, and it comes out with scenes looking far better than before. The cinematography is still quite consistent with the show, but the overall quality far exceeds that of the show and 1.0. I mean, come on, just look at this! I mean, I know that I'm shown in hype trash, but come on, that's pretty amazing. On top of that, the use of CGI is way heavier and more ambitious, and I think Anno really managed to pull it off here. When it works, which is most of the time, you get movements, shots, and scenes that just wouldn't work or would be significantly worse without it. A lot of things are just more expressive, fluid, and the real weight and power of the Ava units is something that's easier to convey with 3D animation. Honestly, I'm really surprised at how well the CG was integrated and how it works. If you watch the last part or you just actively watch anime, I'm sure you probably know that CG and anime can be extremely risky and absolutely does not always come out well. So to see a film, even if it is directed by someone like Anno, pull it off so well is honestly really impressive, and it's satisfying to see that step up from the first film. On the whole, 2.0 is a sequel that manages to sufficiently shake up the entire franchise in new and interesting ways, and actively improves on the first film in nearly every regard. However, Anno's next film would arguably be his most controversial work since the end of Evangelion. But that's a story for another time. That's going to be all for this video guys, I really hope you enjoyed part 2 of the retrospective. I wanted to put as much effort into this video as I could to start this year off with as big of a bang as I could. We did some pretty new stuff with this one, and I'm hoping you guys liked the video, but you can go ahead and let me know down in the comments, or by leaving a like, and if you loved it, hey, consider subscribing. That's going to be all for today guys, happy new year, Ram recorders, peace out, and make sure to take care of yourself.